I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Professor Jonathan Bailey. Professor Bailey is Conservation Programs Director for the Zoological Society of London and is responsible for conservation projects focusing on threatened species and their habitats in more than 80 countries. He conducted his PhD research in the Gulf of Guinea, focusing on restricted range island endemic birds. He ran the Mekongo Conservation Center, a guerrilla ecotourism and research project in the rainforest of Gabon, and has conducted fieldwork in countries such as Tanzania, Namibia, Papua, and also Mongolia. Jonathan represents ZSL on the United for Wildlife Conservation Collaboration with the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry. As you know, the marathon, this marathon is dedicated to the pangolin, which is a result of a dinner that Jonathan very kindly invited me to at the London Zoo. I didn't really know what to expect, but the idea of the London Zoo is a very intriguing one because I think for many Londoners, Londoners it's part of our childhood. What happened that evening was something that was totally unexpected, which is I became kind of galvanized for this wonderful creature, the pangolin, but also got galvanized about the subject that really is the, the, this marathon is dedicated to. It struck a very deep chord and one that I'm extremely grateful to him for really uh, allowing me to focus on and also institutionally uh, for the Serpentine to have a commitment to. So a very warm welcome, please, to Jonathan Bailey. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you, Hans, for inviting me today. And uh, particular thanks for really focusing on the pangolin. I, uh, I wanted to give you this print here that I absolutely love. It's the oldest print that I can find of a pangolin. It's from the late 1700s. And when they first discovered this species, they thought it was some sort of reptile. And now many of us haven't even heard of it, but it's the most illegally traded mammal in the world. And having it as the focal species for this marathon, we're really bringing it into the public consciousness. And that's really the first stage in saving this species. So I am extremely, extremely grateful. So thank you. So I will be talking about uh, the pangolin, but first I'm going to talk about the great diversity of life, what we're doing to this diversity, and some actions we can take to, to reverse this decline. So this is the tree of life. So there's many different estimates of how many species there are. There's probably about 8.7 million species on the planet. And let's say that represents those 8.7 million species. That would represent less than 1% of species that ever existed on this planet. So extinction is a natural process. Extinction happens, but it happens very, very slowly. Now, you in this audience are all extremely lucky. You represent 600 million years of successful reproduction. Your lines have not gone extinct. You are miracles, each and every one of you. Now, we are vertebrates. Basically, we have a backbone. Vertebrates popped up around five, 525 million years ago. We swam around the oceans, and then we crawled out of the ocean onto land on four legs. We turned into things like reptiles and amphibians. We kept going, and then later we turned into mammals. And you're mammals, you have breasts, nipples, or hair. And then from there, we turned into monkeys and uh, primates about 65 million years ago. And then from there, about six million years ago, we broke off from all the other primates, and we went on our own journey. And only about 200,000 years ago, we became homo sapiens. And in the last bit of that 200,000 years, we have had an unbelievable impact on the rest of life. In our time, we've decreased the world's forests by 33%. In this past 100 years, we've removed 50% of the world's wetlands. In the past 30 or 40 years, we've destroyed or degraded the world's mangroves, the world's coral reef systems. Now, these aren't just sort of interesting habitats. These are the most diverse, important habitats on the planet that are important both for humanity, but also for other forms of life. Now, a few weeks ago, I hope you read about this 52% decline in the world's vertebrates. And Julia referred to this. ZSL and WWF put out this report, and it got some media attention. But really, this, this should just be a startling, shocking, maddening statistic that we all want to rally around and do something about. 
Picture yourself in 1970 if you're around looking out the window. You, know, you see a bunch of animals, you see a bunch of birds, and now look at that same window and over half of them are gone. I mean, this is, this is crazy that we've allowed this to happen in our lifetime. We shouldn't just hear this as a statistic and sort of let it run on. So there's population decline and then there's extinction risk. So there's an organization called IUCN. They determine if something's critically endangered, endangered, or vulnerable. And so when I started my conservation career, my first job was to work with a bunch of scientists to figure out how many, what percent of mammals were threatened with extinction. And it turned out that it was 25%. And I thought, that's quite high. But what about all vertebrates? What about reptiles, amphibians, and fish? So we did those too, and it turned out it was 20%. I said, well, that's interesting, but that's only 4% of the world's diversity. So what if we looked at plants? What if we looked at invertebrates? So we took some rambles, random subsets of those, and it turned out that there was this principle of about 20% of the world's species that are threatened with extinction. So again, you swim through the ocean, you're in a river, you're walking through the forest. On average, one in five of those species is threatened with extinction. So it's not a surprise that when we look at current extinction rates and compare them to historic extinction rates, that we're 100 times that of background extinctions. And projections into the future tell us that we'll be 10 times higher than we are now. And really, this is due to population growth and, and consumption. We had relatively stable population growth. That little blip there is the Black Death. And then we start popping up when we learn to really access cheap energy, things like coal and, and, and oil now and gas, which have allowed us to completely accelerate with maximum population growth in the 1960s. And it's now slowed down but we're still putting more people on the planet each week than there are total numbers of other great apes. With this more people on the planet and more demand, we're cultivating more of the Earth's landscape. One fourth of the Earth's landscape is currently cultivated. And to feed this growing population, it's going to continue. And if you look at the map, you'll see the areas that are bare, which aren't cultivated. And the areas that are most likely to be cultivated into the future will be the forest. Because after that, there's just mountains, there's tundra, and desert. So climate change has been talked about. And I'm not going to go into detail about climate change. But in terms of future projections, some scientists are saying we could lose up to 50% of the species on this planet by the end of the century. The reality is we have no idea what the impact is going to be. But we are already seeing signs of species changing distributions and uh, extinction occurring as a result of uh, climate change. Now, for your, those of you that are biologists, you will know that this is completely made up. This is a phylogeny or a family tree. But what I want to illustrate here is what would happen if we randomly lost 40% of the world's mammals. So let's just take a random loss. If that happened, we'd still maintain the diversity of forms. You still have most of the different kinds of species that were there before. And so if they made it through that extinction event, they could evolve and change and adapt into all sorts of different things into the future. But the reality is extinction is not random. Certain groups tend to be much more vulnerable. So what happens is we lose entire branches of the tree of life. They just get cut out. So there's no opportunity for that group of species to evolve and adapt into the future. Now, this is a thylacine, or Tasmanian tiger. They went extinct or shot last one around the 1930s. And when the last individual was gone, it was not just the end of an of a interesting species, it was the end of an entire lineage, an entire lineage of large carnivorous, carnivorous marsupial. Now that's more closely related to a kangaroo than it is to a tiger or, or, a, a, or a dog or anything that looks similar to that. And they're gone forever. Recently we lost the baiji, the freshwater dolphin in China. And yesterday, one of four remaining breeding, breeding northern white rhinos died. There's only four, two are female, two are male. The young male died. There's one male left that's ready to go, but his legs aren't good. So its entire future is quite precarious. That's one of the most charismatic subspecies of Africa that, that basically has maybe started to dive during this very extinction marathon. So to address these issues, we started a program called EDGE which focuses on evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered species. And basically, we take a phylogeny or a family tree of here, it's all mammals. And we look for those species that have really long branch lengths, so few close relatives. And then we use extinction rates, so the IUCN categories and criteria. So if you're more threatened, you score higher. So if you're more different and you're more threatened, you come out at the top. 
and we list the top 100 mammals, the top 100 amphibians, there are a broad range of other groups. And then we really want to focus on these species to make sure that something's done. But the amazing thing was, when we first identified these, that 70% of these mammals were receiving little or no conservation attention, and 80% of the amphibians were receiving little or no conservation attention. These are the most remarkable diff different species on the planet, and we're not even doing anything about them. So some of the species in the top 100 list for mammals you'll have heard of. There's the, the panda, an amazing creature, but some of them will be less common, less known. And this is the pangolin that we've been talking about, and I'll come back to it in a second. But how do you, how do you communicate this? I mean, we've grown up with rhinos, elephants, tigers. Is society ready for the, the golden-rumped elephant shrew, the, the, um, the, the pangolin, the, the long-nosed echidna? Well, in my view, these things are genetically different, they're ecologically different, they look different, they're behaviorally different than all other things on the planet, and in much the same way as unique pieces of art. These things are irreplaceable. They're like Machu Picchu, Great Stone, uh, Great Wall of China. We simply have to think of them as part of our international heritage, and we can't afford to lose them. When we first launched the concept, I was told that nobody would really care about these species. But then it was picked up in every magazine from Gatsia to Hello to Nature to Science. And people do care and want to do something about these amazing creatures. So to save them, we, we go out and we find the best young scientists, best young conservationists around the world, and we support them. We support them to do what we call a blueprint for survival, which is like an action plan. And they have to help bring it into the public consciousness, and they have to tell people what needs to be done to save this species and mobilize people to do it. They have to put their information on the web. This is a long-eared jaboa. When that was filmed for the first time, it was the most popular story of December 2007 on the BBC. People loved it, but they'd never heard of it. We've also got these camera traps now where we're trying to bring these species to life. So you, if you have an iPhone, you can download the app. It's called Instant Wild. These cameras you turn on, they're all over the world. As an animal walks by the camera, an image comes up, it comes down to your phone, and you help identify it. We've had over a million identifications, mostly by young people, helping us identify these species all over the world. We've created an edge TV element so that people can be exposed to these species that you might not even find on the BBC. And now I want to come back to the pangolin. And as Julie was saying, it's really a flagship for this broader range of species. In my view, this is one of those magical creatures on the planet. As I was saying, they thought it was some kind of reptile when they first found it. It, um, it curls up to a ball when it's, when it's scared. And it curls up into a ball, and it protects its young in the middle of that ball. And it also takes its young on its back, and it walks along. It's so gentle, it doesn't even have teeth. It eats ants. It eats about 70 million ants a year. And when it ingests those ants, they get broken down with a couple of rocks in its belly. Its tongue is, in some cases, as long as its body. It's a remarkable, amazing creature. Yet its scales are, are really sought after in the Chinese medicinal trade. People think it helps with lactation or it helps with good skin. But in reality, there's no scientific evidence to support this. But what worries me even more is that people are starting to eat it as a status symbol. If they do a good business deal, they want to eat a pangolin, it's like buying a really good bottle of wine to show that they have status and they're buying one of the most expensive things on the menu. And this is getting more and more popular. And as Julia said, there's this wave, this wave of extinction, where the pangolins of the eight species have started to disappear in Asia. It's going all the way across, and it's now moving into Africa. And over a million have been traded over the past 10 years. So people always say, well, what can I do? You know, what can I do about this? What can I do about the pangolin? What can I do about the long-beaked you know, echidna. And then there's the, just the old school things that we've all been taught when we're little. You know, you can reduce, use less. There's garbage bags here. You can recycle. But there's much more you can do. You can not invest in companies that, are, that don't care about the environment. You can invest in companies that have sustainable strategies. You can make sure that your schools are actually covering the environment. There's a whole range of things you can do. But I would say the most important thing you can do, and you can do today, is Make a dedication to something. Choose one thing in your life. Think about what you're passionate about and dedicate to it. Just one thing, a species, an ecosystem. And not just for a week, not for a month, but for a lifetime. And you can make a difference in that system. And by you doing that, you'll inspire other people. And I think the Extinction Marathon would be a perfect place to start this commitment. Thank you.